Good evening. Thank you all for being here. My name is Kelly Duncan. I am president of the Audubon Commission. You all undoubtedly know Ron Foreman, and to Ron's left is Chris Bardell, who is uh, president of the Audubon Nature Institute. We're very pleased you are here. This is the third of our public meetings regarding the master plan for the Audubon Park. We have very much appreciated your input at these meetings, and frankly, we've had over a thousand comments to our website about the uh, master plan. So we really appreciate all the input you all have been giving. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Ripple, who is a principal at Eskew, Dumez, and Ripple. Thank you. Uh, a show of hands, how many of you have been to either one or both of the previous community meetings? Terrific, great, thanks. Uh, for those of you that have not, we're gonna repeat a couple things just uh, so that the folks that are new to this uh, process uh, can understand what we're doing and where we're going with this master plan. Uh -oh. What did I do? Oh, there we go. Uh, we have an agenda uh, for the evening. Uh, we're gonna be providing an overview of the, uh, of the work that we've done so far. We're also gonna take a couple minutes, and I did a little bit of a, a photo documentary. I spent uh, about four hours, three weeks ago, just walking through the park and observing, and I just wanted to report some of the things, my experiences, as I did that. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the elements of community engagement uh, that we have uh, been using, uh, the methodology that we've been using to gather input, uh, particularly on the web, in addition to these active community meetings. Uh, and then we're gonna get into the specific uh, recommendations. Uh, we break them into three general categories, the first being building on successes. Uh, as we talked about in the first meeting, uh, focus on maintaining and enhancing what is great about the park in conformance with the park, the Audubon Institute's mission. How do we continue to build on that success? Addressing the existing challenges. We've talked about that a lot, particularly at meeting number, number two. And then thirdly, uh, spend a little bit of time looking a little bit further down the road and talking about uh, looking ahead to the future. What opportunities, uh, what challenges lie ahead? And then we're gonna open it up for uh, public comment. It's gonna be a formal uh, public comment session with the microphone here. I think everybody, if you didn't uh, pick up a card when you came in, cards are there at the back uh, and you have the opportunity for two minutes uh, to share your thoughts. Uh, what we have, it's a critical thing. These are not decisions that we'll be sharing, they're recommendations. And even though we're well into the process, many of the things, particularly when we get into traffic planning and thoughts about uh, movement around the campus, we truly do want your input and your thoughts. Uh, sometimes the best ideas come not from the experts, but from the people, the community that uses the park every day. Uh, Tracy? Uh, I wanted to have Tracy, we're, Tracy and I are going to split some, split some of this uh, presentation. I'm going to have Tracy uh, go through some of the methodology and approach that we've used. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Lee with Eskew Dumez Ripple. I'm going to spend a little bit of time, a very little bit of time, talking about where we've been and where we're going, and then a few things that have happened since the last meeting. Uh, some research that we've done, some data gathering that we've done that will inform the recommendations that uh, Mark will spend some time addressing tonight, uh, just to kind of set the table. But I wanted to start for those of you who may not have been to one of the previous meetings by introducing our team. Uh, we'll start with the Ottoman folks, um, our client and the operators of the park and the zoo. Uh, and in particular, Laurie Conkerton, Kyle Burks, and Ashley McLaren have uh, really been integral along with Mr. Foreman and the rest of the staff. Uh, our firm, Eskew Dumas Ripple, is responsible for overseeing the process and documenting what's going on, kind of um, coordinating things. Uh, landscape architects Spackman, Mossop, Michaels have been with us since the beginning. Uh, I think Wes will be joining us tonight. Wes Michaels. Thank you, Wes. Uh, um, Recent player that we've brought on board, uh, Urban Systems Incorporated, as traffic engineers in response to a lot of comments we got after the first and second meetings. 
Um, they're going to, well, so they've already kind of dived in with, to the process with us. Some of the work we're going to show tonight is based on recommendations and observations that, that they've made just in the short time that they've been on board. But uh, Allison Cotterada Michelle is here with us tonight. Uh, and another critical piece that, that we're looking to Urban Systems to provide us with is uh, to act as a liaison as the uh, DPD and DOTD work on Magazine Street happens. We'll be looking to them to help us have a seat at the table to determine how we can influence that work in, in, uh, in the uh, best way for the park, uh, both during the construction period, which is going to be painful for all of us who live near here, as well as for the park, but in the long term as well, to, to try to make sure that we have a way to integrate what we're doing, what we're planning with the work that's going to be done on Magazine Street to the extent that we can. Um, then finally, Urban Act Interactive Studio, uh, Denver-based firm has been responsible for designing the interactive website, the surveys, the um, interesting uh, ways to leave commentary using a map of uh, favorite places and, and such as that. I hope all of you all have had a chance to visit that. And as Kelly said, we've really gotten tremendous community response. Uh, just a few words about the methodology, again, for those of you who may not have been to a previous meeting, and if you've heard this before, please bear with me, I'll keep it brief, uh, to try to um, uh, break this effort down into digestible parts. We've uh, developed, for internal structural reasons, uh, three uh, districts or zones that we're using just to organize the work that we're doing. And the, the golf course and the zoo were not included in the scope of work that we're addressing as planners. Those two pieces are on their own kind of developmental path. And so uh, other than uh, dealing with how they interact with the districts that we are responsible for planning, we're not directly doing work in those areas. But the, the first district is uh, the sort of perimeter area that fronts on St. Charles Avenue, Exposition, and uh, Walnut Streets. Uh, the second is the magazine corridor, in, including and in reaching out to grab, uh, encompass some pretty large uh, areas, margins along Magazine Street, and even reaching all the way over to the Boray Oak, the Tree of Life Oak, uh, just as a way of kind of including that in the discussion. And, and then the third district is the Riverview District, um, the Fly and uh, Athletic Fields, and then reaching down to capture Avenger Field and the tennis courts as part of that. Uh, just a uh, few notes about where we are on the timeline. We're uh, at meeting number three, and it's my pleasure to announce tonight that the Audubon Nature Institute has authorized us to add a fourth community meeting. So please put it in your calendars for Wednesday, May 16th. We'll be having a fourth meeting of community input. Uh, also note on this, this uh, schedule that the online survey, the official survey, closed on March 30th. It ran from J January uh, until the end of March. But I want to make sure everyone understands that there's still an opportunity for public comment on the website. You can leave comments there um, in a couple of different ways. Uh, you can certainly um, express your comments this evening uh, here at these public meetings, uh, as well as uh, email or write comments to the Ottoman Institute. I uh, just want to highlight four pieces of work that have happened in the last 30 days or so, well, that we um, ha have identified in the last 30 days or so. Some of them have gone on longer than that. Uh, and, and these are pieces of research that have, as I said, informed a lot of the recommendations that you'll be seeing tonight. The tree management plan, uh, Audubon had uh, commissioned a firm, a third party firm called Plan It Geo to update the inventory of trees uh, in the park. Over 3,000 trees were uh, measured and uh, uh, mapped using GPS. Uh, and this uh, was just recently completed and builds on the three previous tree evaluations and surveys that were done since 1992. Uh, the traffic analysis I mentioned, Urban Systems, uh, has started doing that work. Um, and it's intended to be completed along with this master plan. Uh, a third piece 
uh, two sets of surveys, the online surveys that I mentioned, which have concluded and we'll be sharing some results from this evening, as well as on the ground, boots on the ground surveys uh, about I think 500 respondents to the surveys that were done over the last couple months uh, here in the park in four or five different locations in the park where uh, real live people actually asked people what they were thinking about, what they thought was good about the park, what they wanted it to be, how they used it, and a lot of valuable information that's uh, informed what we've been uh, thinking about. And then finally, our own uh, land use mapping that we've been doing um, just to kind of get an idea of, of how things are currently used in the park. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to introduce Kyle Burks, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about some of the community engagement elements, including the surveys. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to share with you tonight some of the data that were gathered through the various means that we chose to solicit feedback. How many of you were able to take the online survey at the website? Fair number. Was anyone able to participate in the intercept surveys where you actually met a surveyor in the park? All right, so, so that may be a little bit of a new instrument. Um, and also here, you'll, you'll note that we have our written public comments and then our community meetings. And as we plan this process, it was critical for us to step back and try every possible means of getting feedback. I spent years working with the research uh, group at Walt Disney World, and we were able to do wonderful things with data with that organization, but we always knew some people like to take surveys on computers, some people don't. Some people prefer to speak to someone in person. Some people prefer to write a comment and send it in. Others want to come to an avenue like this. And so as we planned this process, it was critical for us to use every possible means of gathering data. And it, the wonderful thing about it is when you start seeing the same priorities and the same things come up in each one of those, you know that you're getting good, solid, robust, and valid data as you move forward. So uh, just as a little bit of a, uh, an idea, the website survey, we had 950 people take the survey. We did discover uh, there were some people that skipped questions, and those skipped questions, we did not want to influence the data in an incorrect manner, so we took 40 of those out. So we ended up with 910 surveys that were actually fully completed. In that, we had 514 surveys conducted uh, out in the park by the Mori Consulting Group where they intercepted individuals and asked them if they would like to give us some feedback. They did that in three separate locations. Uh, and we tried to focus on getting feedback not just about the park in total, because as we all know, using the park, each section is different. It has its feel and it has its different purpose. So we asked very specifically about Audubon Park, and then we asked separately about the Riverview, and I'll share that information for you as well. Uh, and as Mr. Duncan said, we had thousands of public comments that have come in, and uh, this is our third public meeting, and we're so pleased to have all of you. So the nice thing about it is that across all of these uh, areas, we're coming up with common themes and priorities. So for those of you that took the online survey, you'll recall uh, a section where we said, we asked you, these are, these are things that we could prioritize for the master plan in the park. Please rank them in terms of their, from their highest priority to the lowest. What this summarizes today is the percentage of the individuals that ranked these individual items as their top priority. And you'll notice that the highest is improving drainage in the park. Next is lighting at 14%, improving pedestrian access across Magazine Street. Uh, and that, that also includes bicycle traffic as well. Um, tree preservation at 11%, more shelters and picnic areas, more play areas, and then an operational aspect of providing more security in the park. Now, when we compare that to what we're hearing from public comments and what we're hearing from you all in our breakout sessions at our last meeting, these are very common themes that we're seeing for Audubon Park itself. When we look at the river view, very similar, but slightly different percentages. So improving the lighting at the river view actually is a, uh, the top priority there. We don't have the drainage issues there. And it's a very strong 40% of people in identifying that as their highest priority. Dedicated walking paths and bike paths were the next two 
continuing our aggressive tree preservation program, and then more shelters and picnic areas. So these, that summarizes the highest priorities that were identified from the web survey. Now from there, I want to turn to the intercept surveys. Uh, and the intercept surveys were those 514 individuals who were encountered in the park. Now this one was just asked individuals in each of these four areas, how important is it for you? Is it very important, important, somewhat important, or not important? And this summarizes the very important responses. So 54% of individuals said improving the infrastructure, our drainage, our lighting, making sure our restrooms are up to date and modernized were the highest, 54% uh, of them thought it was very important. Improving our flower beds and our tree preservation program, very high at 53%. Improving security in the park is at 35%. And improving recreation, meaning more play areas, more opportunities for people to enjoy uh, playing and, and recreating in the park was 28%. Now this is a, for Audubon Park as a whole, very similar for uh, the Riverview, and the only difference there is a higher percentage, 40%, uh, in wanting us to improve recreation out on the river view and it fits with some of the the planned use that's already out there so that summarizes some of the research that we were able to do and I'm going to turn it over back over to Mark at this point thank you we've in both of the community meetings we've also uh, drilled down on the what are the organizing principles of the park and as I mentioned I, I guess it was three weeks ago spent four hours just randomly kind of walking the park and just taking it all in and we spent a lot of time since then thinking about this and talking about it and it did occur to us to the, the planning team that as you look at these organizing principles the over overwhelming idea that ties it all together is achieving balance We've talked in previous meetings about achieving the balance between act ideas about what this park is, what it means to you, and how it can best suit the, the greatest number of people. Balance between active and passive. But it also occurred to me as we were walking around, as I look at the, the principles, there's a balance between people at the focus and nature at the focus. And by that I mean the park is this beautiful manifestation of our society. It's a social and cultural construct as much as a natural construct. And sometimes those two are pulling in different directions. You know, somebody that wants to experience nature in a very clear, serene kind of setting, as opposed to somebody that comes, as they did three weeks ago, for an MS walkathon and to join in in a social kind of celebration. So I put together a little, it's about a three or four minute uh, little slideshow with some captions and uh, just, I think, captures kind of our experience and thoughts about the park. We strive for balance between fundamental ideas about the park and its mission. Balance between active recreation and passive relaxation. Between nature as the focus and people as the focus. We strive to celebrate each. Since its inception, the park has straddled the Victorian ideals of passive contemplation versus the progressive ideals of the strenuous life. Much has changed since the park's inception in the 1890s, and much remains the same. But at its core, the park provides the opportunity to retreat from the urban condition for a moment and to refresh one's soul. It can be done through the contemplation of nature or by active engagement with nature. Any of you remember the uh, swan thing, hopefully? Yes. Or simply observing the natural condition. It gives us a place to rest a while, to enjoy one's family, to play, to decompress. Fountains become watering holes Open spaces become cross-country routes. Trees become art objects. We experience the power and the majesty of the river. We socialize. We dream. We use the park in new and unanticipated ways, ways that reflect our culture and our values. 
we celebrate as a community. Our rituals take on a deeper and richer meaning. And our collective memory of life's experiences is enhanced. We experience the unique qualities of an urban park in a magical city where culture and activities constantly evolve. An open space becomes a frisbee football field. A baseball diamond becomes a soccer field. A soccer field becomes a crawfish boil. A fountain becomes a photo opportunity or a dog bathtub. A tree becomes a bed. There are opportunities for the healthy as well as the infirmed. A single venue can become either active or passive, depending entirely on the users. Programmed activities such as golf provide opportunities for inspiring vistas, complementing one's experience of the park, framing views, and celebrating the historic architectural context. For this is an urban park in a delicate balance with a historic residential neighborhood where one's experience accentuates the other and the lines are necessarily blurred. We can choose the well-worn paths or the paths less traveled. We strive to balance needs between cars and pedestrians. We strive to provide more gracious accommodations for families and accessibility for all. The park has changed much in the last century and much remains the same. We strive for opportunities to refresh our soul as a group and as an individual. So we look for balance. So with that, we're gonna talk about some of the opportunities that we see. Uh, again, these are evolving. Uh, we have specific ideas. Some of them are more fully formed. Some of them are simply recommend recommendations. Some of them are just ideas that we're still exploring and we sincerely appreciate your input and thoughts as we share. And as we said, breaking it into three categories, building on success, addressing existing challenges, and looking to the future. So we have five items under building for success. The first is maintaining that balance that I just spoke of, finding the balance and variety of land uses. Uh, secondly, since it was number one on so many lists and in so many comments, ideas about lighting, uh, primarily tied to security and safety. Uh, secure, third, security uh, during and after the park hours. Uh, the fourth, drilling down on the formal programmed activities within the park and reaching conclusions about them. And then fifth, stewardship of the ecology, primarily through a tree management program. So as we think about maintaining balance, one of the clarifications is we don't see this as a black and white issue. There, as if there is just formally programmed spaces and then informally or just passive open space. There's a spectrum, in fact, between active and passive. And I think it's worth, as we're looking at it, we're understanding those distinctions. You know, between a baseball diamond that is completely fenced in, that's clearly intended for baseball and only baseball, and immediately adjacent to it, a soccer field that as soon as soccer is over, it can be used for dog walking or kite flying or just laying on the grass. And so there's a varying spectrum of things that we look at. Uh, what we've heard over the last several months, what we've heard uh, anecdotally, what we've heard in these meetings, and what the, survey, uh, uh, the surveys suggest is that while there are points of view at, uh, at extreme ends where it says, yes, uh, we would like to have more formal programmed activities. I think one of them that was speaking very loudly, loudly in the last meeting was tennis, the idea that we have the tennis facilities, we'd like to have more. And there are also uh, extremes on the other end saying it is overbuilt, it is too much, we need to decant formal programs. We believe that the majority, in fact, in this occasion is correct, that the balance that we currently have is appropriate and correct. 
Uh, we do not advocate for more formal development of the park. Uh, and as such, it's consistent with the first thing I think that I said when we were up here two meetings ago. The goal for us is to find, not to expand on what is being done at the park, simply to make the, the range of options and opportunities available to park goers uh, better, more useful, more rewarding. So to do what we're doing better rather than to expand on it. So in that regard, a lot of the basis over there, and there are some things where we're specifically decanting. We'll talk about parking on tree routes. Uh, but for the most part, what we're recommending is maintaining that balance that exists today. Uh, second category is lighting. Uh, lighting primarily tied uh, to security. Been a lot of discussion. The primary focus, as we saw, was in two areas. It was around the walking paths and biking trails. And again, this is a delicate balance. We know that although the park hours officially are in a certain time frame, that in fact the beauty of this park is it is open. It's not a fenced-in park. The doors aren't locked uh, at dusk. Uh, it's an opportunity for the community to engage uh, as it sees fit, and that has evolved as well. So providing uh, reasonable safety and accommodations for folks to where they do feel safe and secure when they're using the park. Is a, is a primary objective, and that's been reinforced by the, uh, by the survey information. Uh, the big, it was a yellow dot, but it reads as a green dot on this screen, and the upper left-hand corner is that upriver portion of the river view. What we've seen, what we've heard, and what we understand anecdotally is it's a popular place for casual relaxation, and there have been questions raised about can, in, in fact, there be uh, a degree more security and lighting. So that's an area where we're specifically uh, focusing. Uh, the upper images are not terribly compelling in this slideshow. They look great on our computer at home. Uh, but we understand, as you look at the images, on the, the two images on the bottom, we understand and accept the fact that for major play activity, formal play activities such as baseball, that there's the need for the stadium lighting. We understand the sensitivity of that in terms of lighting bleeding into the neighborhood. Uh, we also have the lighting along the river that you see at the lower right. What we're looking at and exploring is ways in which the lighting can be much more subtle, much more subdued uh, in areas where we're looking to add. There are a number of good examples of landscape lighting that it accentuates the walk path with a minimal number of foot candles that's there just for the minimal modicum of both safety and you know, avoiding obvious kind of trip and falls if you happen to be walking at night. So finding that delicate balance where there is sufficient lighting to acknowledge this clear need and this clear desire on the part of the public, but not overdoing it to where it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is objectionable, particularly to the neighborhood. Uh, security, we were thinking of security in uh, three measures. In, th uh, in general, the, the, I should explain the, the dots. Again, the upper left-hand corner, that portion of the river view, lighting and security have been tied in the comments that we've received and what we've seen uh, anecdotally. Uh, the five circles that are around the, the, uh, the jogging uh, bike path are the areas where security vehicles access that path uh, to do security rounds. Uh, we believe that there needs to be improvement in that area because it's a point where vehicles, safety, uh, security vehicles and pedestrians and joggers and bikers all come together. So what we're looking at is ways in which that can be made more safe, safe and uh, to be able to avoid any potential problems there. And we think of security at three levels. Number one, technology. There's been a lot of uh, healthy commentary about security cameras, security phones. Uh, we're exploring what that means and where that might be most useful. Uh, obviously, the security staff, as was touched on earlier, that's an operational thing, but certainly the number and frequency of people, security folks that are in the park is directly uh, tied to uh, the overall safety and security of the park. And then thirdly, something that's not often considered is the landscaping and planting plan. Sometimes shrubs can be uh, both enhanced security and in fact at the opposite end be detriments to security because of the ability for folks to, to hide behind shrubbery. So as we uh, develop these recommendations, we're gonna be looking specifically at how we can do landscaping at the lower scale, not talking about trees, but shrubs and low scale landscaping uh, to enhance security. 
Uh, the programmed activities, primary fo primarily focused on tennis, uh, baseball and soccer, horseback riding and swimming, and then the playgrounds, uh, it's hard to see, but the item number four over there on the St. Charles Avenue side, the, the two playgrounds. Most of the attention has been focused on the programmed activities because those are the ones that generate ancillary issues such as uh, traffic and access. So we've been drilling down. Uh, there was good information, some misinformation. This is incomplete as of right now, but what we're doing is getting the, the data together that shows uh, exactly what the programmed activities are. And with this, I'm gonna ask uh, Tracy Lee to come up to the mic, because Tracy, I'm doing some of the broad overview. Tracy is the one that's drilling down on many of these uh, issues. Sure, as, as uh, Mark said, um, we heard a lot from the tennis folks and from the softball, baseball, and soccer people, and, and so we felt like we needed to drill down more deeply into that and get to the bottom of it and try to make sure for our own purposes in, in uh, evaluating those areas that it wasn't just a few loud voices. And what we found was, in fact, there is a huge amount of demand, and uh, perhaps you can see these statistics up here, maybe a little hard to read the text. Um, so the tennis courts get a lot of use. Uh, there are 10 courts, um, six baseball fields, between three and six soccer fields, depending on how you count it. Two, there are two regulation fields, one half field, and then uh, for the younger players, those get divided up. Um, but I guess the, the conclusion that we reached is that although those are pretty much maxed out in their use and there's plenty of demand, and, and a lot of uh, people feel like perhaps those facilities should be expanded, in trying to maintain this balance that we're talking about between programmed activities and more casual, looser, more natural, organic activities. Um, as professional planners, our recommendation is to, to not increase those facilities, but rather to, in the case of the tennis courts, invest in resurfacing them and improving them uh, and just trying to make a better experience for those users who really are quite a large constituency of the park. Yeah, i tell you what, uh, what we'll do is, and we probably should have made that clear, so we'll uh, reserve commentary till the end, so please make notes of any and all comments, questions, and we'll get to that when we finish the presentation. Thanks. Uh, tree management, has, which has already been mentioned, is, is crucial. Uh, maintaining and continuing the robust tree management program that's already in place is essential. Everybody with the park, and certainly we as the, the uh, uh, planners, understand how critical uh, maintaining a healthy uh, tree program uh, is, and we recommend that that be continued to be uh, maintained. Uh, specifically, the one issue that we heard again and again that was uh, a concern was uh, the limitation, if not prohibition, of parking uh, on the tree roots uh, throughout. Uh, in particular, there, and I'm sorry, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, there's been a pretty extensive inventory of all of the trees. Uh, there are much more detailed reports that were part of the last master plan, and those will be included as appendices uh, on this master plan as well. We're looking at parking on the tree roots. One of the flagrant areas where this occurs quite a bit is out at the Riverview, and in particular on those days where there are a number of uh, planned activities. Uh, and I'm also gonna ask Tracy, we don't have a slide because it's being prepared, but I'm gonna ask Tracy to speak about the numbers. Tracy actually went out there and uh, counted uh, actual paved parking spaces, but more importantly, we made an assessment of how many informal parking spaces there are by people simply parking on the grass. Sure, I think we, we do have a slide. Oh, oh there yeah. we go. Okay, well, a little hard to read, but I did spend some time out there walking around uh, early one morning, early uh, Good Friday morning, when the place was not crowded and I could get a good assessment. Um, the the um, spaces are not striped currently, all the striping's been worn away, but I, I paced them off and did some measuring in, uh, in AutoCAD 
And um, I personally, and I've lived in this neighborhood for more than 20 years, I was surprised to find how many actual legitimate, I'll call them paved, parking spaces there are up there, over 460 parking spaces. Uh, and then just through, um, again, kind of pacing off and just uh, generally eyeballing the, what was going on out there, I determined that at a maximum, there are another 140 or so spaces, potential spaces where there's not a curb or anything, bollards or anything to prevent someone from just pulling off the side of the drive. Uh, again, kind of um, a rough estimate, but I, I believe that from what I observed and, and noted on the drawings that we have, depending on how accurate they are with regard to tree locations, that probably about a third of those 140 spaces are where people are actually parking under the drip line of the tree. So I, I think one of the uh, hard choices that we'll need to make here as planners as we try to, to find a way to accommodate everyone is uh, we are recommending to block off or somehow prevent people from parking under the drip lines of the trees and we'll show some ideas about how that might be done in a, a graceful natural way. But that does mean that we're taking 40 or so spaces, 40, 50 spaces out of, uh, out of commission, which is going to exacerbate the problem with parking there already. So uh, how to mitigate that uh, is something that we are investigating, um, certainly open to ideas that anyone might have about it. Uh, here are some ideas about how that's been done uh, in other locations, sometimes just as simple as bollards, uh, nicely spaced uh, wooden bollards but also uh, through landscaping and, and planting uh, and the use of the way the edges of the roads are treated um, can help with that situation. Thank you. Uh, and we are also going to talk about, that's a good segue to this next section. So the addressing of the existing challenges as we see them. Uh, first and foremost, we had a lot of conversations about Magazine Street and the crossings, and obviously this is uh, both us as planners as well as the City of New Orleans that is actively planning uh, the resurfacing and uh, resurfacing of Magazine Street. Uh, number two, we're going we're gonna to show you some thoughts. They are preliminary thoughts, uh, in-progress uh, thoughts, right, Allison? Uh, on how we might think differently about the Riverview uh, circulation. Uh, number three, how we might improve drainage for the short term. I would say that what are the short term mitigation options that might be available. And, number, uh, and then finally, what about the, uh, the, what can we do to maintain and enhance the architectural, wonderful architectural features that exist in the park right now. Uh, so as you well know, this is, uh, shows the path of access to and from the river view. Uh, the, the white line right down the middle on the right, if you can't read it, that's Magazine Street. The top part of the screen is the upriver uh, side. The lower part is the, the downriver side. It runs out, crosses the levee, crosses the railroad tracks, extends across, uh, across the length. Uh, the dashed-in area is the little spur that allows a, uh, a second access uh, to the uh, baseball and adjacent uh, soccer. And then there are actually two means out of uh, the Riverview. One, the more commonly used one, goes back to Magazine Street, where there is a, both a, a, a left turn and a, a peel off, I guess, a spur to the right. But secondly, there's also a, an ability to exit the park at Chapatulas. That's where the bus loop is, and we'll be talking about that. So uh, we, we've spent several hours looking at this in its worst case condition. We were out there the, the day that, uh, we had, what was it? It was the sheriff's uh, Easter egg hunt. It was the MS walkathon. It was a major event uh, at the zoo. Uh, there were four things. It was this perfect storm of activity. So we saw everything at once. Uh, we are doing formal traffic studies and traffic counts right now to, to be able to validate the things that we're seeing and understanding anecdotally. Uh, this has been a hot item. There were a number of very spirited uh, debates and ideas at the table that I uh, moderated at the last meeting 
the people that had intriguing ideas. Uh, people have written us lengthy emails talking about, well, if you connected to Leak Avenue, what would that do? What about that old Riverfront Expressway? How about that? Uh, there have been some other I ideas about perhaps changing one way to two way, uh, one specific idea about creating a loop within the park to where people can drop folks off and leave. Uh, one of the things that this all ties together is one of the general approaches that we would like to strongly recommend is one of the things that exacerbates this problem is that there's so few options uh, to, to walk, as we found, with uh, families watching families negotiate children and, ba and strollers uh, up on the edge of the, of the roadway to get to this park if they did, in fact, choose to park elsewhere. Uh, bicyclists that have every intention of going up there and perhaps have to dodge cars. So we do believe that the, the most positive form of mitigation of the traffic problem is perhaps not changing traffic patterns formally, but providing viable options for people to graciously be able to access this by foot, uh, by bike, and certainly with uh, folks that have families that have uh, children in tow. So we're going to show two options. They're rather, uh, you know, they, again, they're not fully cooked, but certainly there we see vi both opportunities and challenges with both of them. The first is, as radical as it may sound, to consider the possibility of two-way uh, access. Uh, this is, again, looking at it from, with Allison on the traffic planning, but just hearing, seeing, understanding anecdotally uh, what the soccer families go through on a busy day, people that just simply want to drive through park and sit and relax by the river's edge and then leave, what they experience. We understand there's some challenges we can do very little about, like the schedule of trains that in fact block people in, sometimes for quite some uh, period of time, uh, as well as the safety issues associated with uh, the train routes and people trying to go to and from. But uh, this was, an, was and still is an intriguing idea. One of the biggest challenges, though, as you know, looking at it from the, at the top, it's already a two-way condition on the first, uh, uh, the upriver element up at the uh, top. And then once you cross over, go through the gates, and cross over the levee and the railroad track, it becomes one way going downriver. So one of the options we're exploring is, uh, can we in fact make that two-way, and a critical thing, could we do it two-way without having to widen anything? You know, there's great both anecdotal and now traffic analysis studies that show in fact a fairly narrow two-way uh, uh, street is in, in some ways is, is uh, preferable because in fact it causes traffic to slow down if you're at a, what a 20 foot wide versus a 24 foot, and you know that you've got to be a little bit more careful as you would know driving through parts of the French Quarter rather than driving on uh, you know, airline highway, uh, it is a traffic calming feature to an extent. The challenge as we saw with this scheme is at the, uh, as at the downriver end at the east uh, connection at Magazine. Uh, the complications associated with that, that intersection as well as the complications that already exist up on River Drive at the upriver side, uh, at the downriver side it would be exacerbated by having now uh, multiple access points in and out. So it led to another thing that we're contemplating. Again, we're looking at it, and now that we'll, hopefully in a couple weeks' time, we'll have detailed data on, on traffic counts and vehicular counts to where we can do, with Allison's direction, can do a, a much more detailed analysis. But we're intrigued also by the idea that perhaps we can create two one-way-in conditions. Oh, I'm sorry, keep the two-way in and out up at the, at the upriver end on River Drive but switch the, uh, the east drive from one way out to one way in. And then the two ways that people can go out are to continue out on River Drive up at the top, but also to peel off on Chapatulas. Uh, we're gonna look in a section in a second about what that intersection looks like. And again, we'll be looking at the pros and cons. There are no easy answers. These are all you know, relative conditions where if it's got three pluses and two minuses, maybe it's a better condition. But there, you know, suffice to say, we see no easy answers that will just universally, there's no magic wand here. So we're looking at is how we can incrementally improve the visitor experience. 
So as we look at those three intersections a little bit more, these are all works in progress, therefore they're sketches, and you'll see the sketches sometimes are a bit hard to read because sometimes it's just pencil and pen overlay on uh, base maps. Uh, in the final document, these will be much more uh, legible. But we'll call it the west intersection up at the top. Uh, that is complicated because it's also a bus uh, turnaround and a bus stop within that loop. Uh, the zoo intersection in the middle, and then the east intersection, the, the current exit uh, condition from the river view. Uh, that's it. Of course, many of you are familiar with it if you've used the park. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, the area, the dashed circle is where all of these things currently come together. If you look over on the right where it says relocate walk, ba uh, bike and walk path, you see the dash line that heads straight to the middle of that circle. That's where the current existing asphalt bike and walk path goes and goes right smack dab in the middle of all of these other things. So in addition to that, of course, on, as we found out for those of you that came that way uh, an hour or two ago, it's Magazine Street is crazy sometimes even on a day where you can't figure out where all these people are going to and from. So we have significant traffic going uh, throughput on Magazine and then a significant number of folks that are turning in and out, left turn and right turn uh, conditions. So these are just thoughts that we're gonna be exploring over the next couple weeks. Uh, one would be, what if we did, and, and right now it was scary to see even in the time we spent there watching a biker just decide, well, hey, I'm not gonna wait anymore for cars. I'll be here all day and took a shot and thank God he wasn't hit. So are there ways in which one simple idea might be, can we relocate the bike path, essentially get uh, more activities out of that crucial dashed in circle to where everything happens. What can we peel out to distribute some of this uh, density of activity? So the thought here is that perhaps we can change to a new pedestrian crossing a little bit further away, a little bit further downriver, if you will, and connect as it goes over to the left. We'll show you where that might go, but essentially create a new bike and walking path that goes all the way out to the Riverview entrance. And then secondly, it's a, it, it's a marginal uh, change, but it may be something that's significant, is that right now where the word bus stop is, you see the arrow going to the left, right now that is in fact a two-way. So what happens is you get cars that are both turning left and right, cars that are peeling out left and right, the range of options for people going and coming is incredible. So uh, one thought would be uh, to shift the outbound traffic to turn right, uh, on the, the loop, on the outside loop of the bus stop. Of course, all of this is in conjunction with, uh, you know, having to work with the city and with Metro to figure out, is this acceptable? But it is, uh, the, the only viable option that we can see that could improve things is to disperse the density of it. So that's the general idea there. Uh, in, in the middle, in the section uh, B, this is the main path to the zoo and to the, uh, to the pool area. Uh, two ideas there. Number one is uh, exploring, and again, this is, would be subject, right now it's just anecdotal, it would be subject to further detail and traffic study and, watch, and uh, studying pedestrian movement. But we're thinking that perhaps that might be a second viable option for a pedestrian crossing. There's some great examples. Pedestrian crossings are no longer just simple striped uh, areas. Uh, they can be elevated, and I forgot the term. Allison, what's it called, the elevated? Table, yeah, elevated tables. So in fact, you've probably seen them in some cities. In fact, think of a, a speed bump that might be 20 or 30 feet wide, perhaps with a different texture and a different color. So in fact, pedestrians just naturally slow down as they see a, an elevation change and a textural condition. So rather than the old days, which is just ye yellow paint, how can we make something much more robust that becomes both, a, increases safety and becomes a traffic calming uh, feature. In addition, we'll be exploring, again, this is much more about Magazine Street than it is about Audubon Park, but perhaps the, some of the congestion is caused by people that are waiting, to make, that are going uh, upriver and want to make a left turn into the zoo. So we're exploring whether we can create a left turn lane there to relieve some of the traffic congestion that happens. 
Uh, and the third is the downriver uh, exit to Magazine Street. Uh, you can't quite see it from this photo, but this is the, the folks that are coming out here are making a left turn to go upriver onto Magazine. If you look way over to the left side, you'll see the opportunity to peel off prior to that uh, little spur that allows people to make a right turn on the magazine. But again, we know on busy days, this is still a problem. And in fact, one of the air, uh, issues is perhaps that uh, there is a roadway on this side that allows the Audubon security vehicles uh, to be able to access the jogging path to be able to do their security rounds. So we're just asking the question, could we in fact relocate the bike and walking path a little bit further upriver, get it out of that immediate uh, crossing? Could we, in fact, change the direction of the traffic at this point to where this becomes an inbound rather than an outbound uh, condition? And can we, just as we're doing on the upriver side, can we use this as an opportunity to extend a complete new bike and walking path along the edge of the roadway, the entire length of this roadway over to Riverview? And as then as we move further inboard toward Riverview, up at the top we have that intersection that you're familiar with, that's the blue truss that is uh, the entrance to the Riverview point. And then the two points below that we're gonna look at is the egress point across at the downriver end where it crosses the railroad tracks, and then a little bit further on that path where it intersects with Chapatulas. Uh, this did happen to be the point at which, I must admit, where the, uh, the sheriff's uh, uh, Easter egg hunt was, the, it was in full swing. Uh, so it might not be the typical condition, but it was, uh, it was painful to see the number of uh, folks, with, particularly with young kids, families, and strollers that were moving along the edge of the, of the, uh, the, the, the street and hoping to, to not get hit by a car. So we see great opportunity here to create, again, if we can create viable options to simply driving and provide a gracious way for people to walk and people to bike, we do believe that that can mitigate some of the traffic and parking issues that are at the, at the park. Uh, so what we're looking at is coming from the left side, you see the green line, that is, would be the bike and walking path that's coming from that upriver Magazine Street uh, intersection that we talked about. Uh, this is not fully formed. It is a, a fairly complicated intersection there where you have the option of uh, going to the Riverview as well as going into the administrative areas of the Audubon Institute. So we're looking at is ways in which we can graciously get people from the parking lot uh, to uh, 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 walking paths. Uh, ways in which we can graciously and safely get people to cross the, uh, those uh, vehicular access points, and then kind of connecting the dots. So you see in the upper note that there's a wonderful existing bike and walk path uh, that in fact goes right to the road and stops. So could we in fact do crossings and extend those bike and walk paths? Uh, we're showing the levee walk that's currently in use. It's just a dirt path. It could stay a dirt path if that's the, the highest and best use. It could be maybe a more impervious material that allows somebody that's either in a wheelchair or somebody that's pushing a, a baby stroller. But So there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, it's not like this can't be done. It's just the, the challenges of, of seeing it through. Uh, as we look at the downriver side, of course, it's uh, the joggers, the walkers, the bikers just, uh, you know, fend for themselves uh, with the cars. So the opportunity there is to connect. You see the green line coming in from, uh, from the top. That's that walking path that runs on top of the levee, uh, providing connections with walking paths that connect uh, uh, all the way back, ideally back to Magazine Street. So the intersection, you see the bus loop on the right-hand side. So that's where the Chapatula Street bus uh, ends its route, stops. I guess it picks up passengers there and continues. So we're just simply looking at if this, in fact, was a one-way coming in from magazine. Is there some uh, reconfiguration of that that creates a roundabout that clarifies entry and exiting? So these are just ideas that we'll be exploring over the next several weeks. That if, in fact, there's the sense that we can create one way to that point and two-way options from that point uh, toward the river view, that it might improve things. Uh, we're not advocating for any more paving of spaces. What we see is there's a lot of what we call informal parking that happens, gravel surfaces, and that's fine, but from an environmental standpoint, it means you've got pervious material, you're not creating 
uh, more impervious surfaces. But we think we're going to drill down a little bit and see if there aren't ways that we can simply organize it to where in those peak periods, like we experienced three weeks ago, are the ways in which parking can happen more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, there's also been conversations about reactivating the zoo cruise. It's an existing facility. There's no need for any expansion, as best we can tell or understand. In expanding, uh, it's simply reactivating what is there. And it was, you know, the idea of having this wonderful public connection, particularly as we look to continue to expand uh, the reinventing the Crescent, the upriver park, and find ways in which people that are experiencing the river along m several parts across the uh, locations across the city might in fact connect from one to another. Might be a really nice amenity. A drainage. A drainage is in some cases a nuisance, in some cases it's significantly more than that. Uh, the area of particular focus has been along Exposition Boulevard. It's more than a nuisance when, in fact, there are times where with heavy rainfall, it affects people, particularly property owners, along that side. Uh, it's a nuisance when it's a mud hole. We look at it that if it dries up within 72 hours and doesn't become a mosquito-infested pond, in fact, it's not a nuisance. It's a bioswale. It is part of, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, but it's part of a much more robust green infrastructure program that the city of New Orleans has adopted most notably in Gentilly, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when we look at the drainage issues and we focus on the real problematic areas, particularly the ones along the walking, the walking trails, uh, you know, along Exposition Boulevard and then that side, we start looking at how are there incremental ways in which we can resolve the, uh, the issues uh, uh, that, that currently exist there. Ways in which you know, we have this wonderful stormwater detention system, it's called the lagoon. Uh, it's there. It's why it was there. It was why it was built there uh, 120 years ago. And we'll talk about that more in a second with green infrastructure. So what we're exploring is different kinds of profiles, ways in which the strategy has shifted in this city, thank God, from this idea we're just going to pave, pipe, pump, and hope that the pump stations hold. There's a much more uh, uh, expansive idea of how we can hold water on site and see it as an asset rather than a liability. So we're exploring different ways in which that might happen to, for the short term to be able to connect these low spots with the lagoons. Uh, and finally, the, uh, we have a wonderful, beautiful uh, built environment that we're pleased to be uh, celebrating. One of the surprises in the survey was there was virtually no commentary in any of the uh, online surveys about what can or should be done uh, with Shelter 13. There were a number of anecdotal, just uh, uh, you can call them opposing views. There were a handful of folks that said, restore it to its original condition as a shelter, but an equal number of, of views, and this is certainly, uh, we do see this as, as architects and designers, that expressed a concern that the shelter is so close to Magazine Street. Magazine Street is, is not necessarily a safe place where you'd want to gather in a shelter, particularly if you're gathering for a family reunion. You've got three-year-olds and they're whatever 50 or 60 feet from a busy intersection so there have been a number of concerns raised about how do we if we do keep this how can we possibly make it safe we don't believe fencing it in and padlocking it so we're still exploring what this means obviously one option is there is a historic significance to the building but it's not a building that's on the historic register it's part of the historic fabric but certainly one option that's been contemplated is taking it uh, demolishing it and restoring it to uh, green space. But there's no clear direction at this point, and we hope that uh, more ideas will emerge over the final weeks. Uh, there are the Hearst uh, Bridge and the Himes Fountain are wonderful ar architectural uh, features that have historic significance, and we're going to talk, be talking about specific things like, you know, concern, uh, le legitimate concerns about, well, back in the 30s, there was no idea about a 42-inch guardrail because there was no concern that the issues of liability were less focused than they are now. So we're looking at, can we make these more safe and but maintain and uh, respect the historic integrity of this beautiful uh, set of uh, architectural treasures that we have. 
So as we look to the future, first and foremost, when we talk about water and drainage, since it was at the top of so many people's list, uh, we think of it, there are short-term fixes that help resolve things, but there's a longer-term opportunity, uh, a way of thinking about uh, green infrastructure. Uh, they, it's, it's important to note that in the 1890s, this, you know, we'd say the urban water plan, you can see it on the lower right, major uh, volume of work, incredible piece of work uh, that has put New Orleans at the forefront of green infrastructure in this country, and now we're actually implementing it as well. But it's based on the fundamental idea we can't keep paving and building higher walls and uh, pumping all the water out. We've got to learn to live with water, see it as an asset rather than liability. Uh, the designers of this park understood that 120 years ago. Uh, the lagoons are not natural features. The lagoons were specifically uh, designed not just to create this wonderful balance between water and, uh, and land and landscape, but for very pragmatic reasons. We had low-lying flat uh, land. They wanted to build it up, so they did a basic, what engineers call a cut and fill. They excavated, they built it up, they did plant, allowed plantings on the edge to hold the edge and prevent erosion. And that's essentially the attitude that the city is bringing to uh, green infrastructure 120 years later. We embrace that, we think it's a wonderful idea, and parks are perfect opportunities to do that because there is green spaces and wonderful examples where, uh, where water and lagoons are seen as, uh, as assets rather than liabilities. I'm gonna have Tracy come up and talk about some of the specific uh, thoughts on the uh, lagoon, stabilizing the lagoon and cleaning it. Yeah, um, the stabilization of the lagoon, we just kind of co-opted for our own plan, but this was in the original 2004 uh, master plan for the park. Uh, and there are a lot of great reasons to do it. Uh, there are issues of um, erosion but also uh, water quality and uh, trying to make sure that the green and brown algae don't take over the entire lagoon. So uh, that's something that's very much on the map and we encourage that and uh, agree with it. Um, Mark talked about green infrastructure and it's a kind of a buzzy word that people are using these days, but uh, I think the, the research and the planning that's been done, design work that's been done, as Mark mentioned, a lot of it here in, in New Orleans uh, really substantiates that it's a, a better way to go about dealing with stormwater and water in general. So we encourage that and we'll certainly be making recommendations that the, the master plan, through the master plan, that the park continue on that way. Uh, you want to talk about this part? Sure. You know, one of the things that's not known except maybe for arborists or botanists or uh, Bob Thomas, is Bob here today? No. Uh, a mature cypress tree can evapotranspirate up to 800 gallons of water per day. So what it means is taking in water at the roots and evapotranspirating it into the atmosphere. Trees are one of the best natural ways in which uh, water can be, uh, water issues and drainage issues can be mitigated. So the beauty of the, the tree program, the robust tree program that the Audubon Institute has uh, initiated and continued with is that with continued greening and reforestation and filling in a strategic infill of trees as they die or need to be replaced is that it supports it enhances uh, uh, green ideas about uh, storm drainage and, and stormwater mitigation. And you know, bioswales can be simple divots. And again, the triggering thing is we don't want water to sit for more than 72 hours because there's studies that show how long it takes mosquito larva to develop. But again, water on a site, particularly a park, is a natural condition. So it, it only becomes an issue when it's ending up in somebody's uh, living room or it becomes a, a safety hazard. So understanding the difference between the slight nuisance conditions of drainage and the real drainage issues that do indeed need to be addressed is an important consideration as well. Uh, the second thing is that we believe that as part of the identity of the park, that the park can look, and again, this is a long-term recommendation looking to the future, a consistent and coherent signage 
wayfinding and identity program. Partly just for practical reasons. You need to know where you are, where you're going, but also, again, it's, it is, a, uh, in parks that have done this, it's a pretty powerful thing. It provides a consistent identity. This is a big sprawling park and having it feel like it is one coherent thing can be done with signage and wayfinding. And then finally, we wanted to throw this in because it has come up in both of the conversations, strategic acquisitions. Uh, there are properties upriver along the uh, along, uh, outboard of the, the levee and upriver from the, uh, from the Riverview area uh, that in fact are privately owned properties. And we would encourage, uh, I think it was one of the suggestions uh, at the last meeting, uh, wouldn't it be great in a perfect world if we were able to expand the park? So rather than thinking of it as this landlocked thing, imagine how nice it would be if in fact we could make it a little bit bigger, particularly again understanding the huge asset that we have with a park that engages one of the you know, great rivers of the Western Hemisphere. So the expansion of that land to be able to more fully appreciate the relationship between the park and the river would be a phenomenal thing. Uh, so those are the 12 recommendations. As you can see, many of them are still in process, but we do have clear ideas about where we're going. Uh, but particularly on the traffic planning, it's going to be subject to a lot of work over the next uh, 30 days to drill down and figure out if there are ways in which we can address, mitigate some of the problems that we've got. Uh, with that, we open it up for public uh, comment, and we, uh, for those of you that have filled out cards, thank you. This is a two-minute uh, comment period, and Allison is coming on up. So uh, come on up to the mic. Oh, okay. Paul O'Neill, come on up to the mic. Good. Up. Oh. It's on? Okay. Uh, I guess one of my questions was about the lighting around the running track. I've been living here about 15 years in the neighborhood, and it just seems it's not functional at all at night. It's so dark, it seems the lighting we have is more of an aesthetic value as opposed to a functional value in terms of being able to feel safe and use the park till the, like, yeah, I think it closes at 10 o'clock normally. But it's so scary at night because it's so dark, nobody uses it. That's a that's an excellent point, and that's we we and the surveys show that you're not alone. That lighting is one of the top uh, comments that we're getting and that we're hearing. So finding a way to increase and improve the lighting where it's sufficient, but it doesn't become uh, a nuisance to uh, to uh, the neighbors is is finding that sweet spot. Well, there is there more of like lighting where it's more aimed at the track as opposed to like a 360 degree way of spreading the light so it doesn't interfere with the neighbors that have bought houses around Yes, the park. there is. Yes, and okay. we'll be exploring that, but it's absolutely valid. We want to put the light precisely where right. it's needed and nowhere else. So that uh, the understanding uh, where those issues are most prevalent and focusing on those areas and giving just the light that's needed is going to be one of our top priorities. Can I say one more, one more question? Certainly. Okay. Um, any plans in the future to dismantle the golf course and make it more green space accessible to the community as opposed to a select few people that play that game? Uh, there are no plans to <laughs> dismantle the golf course. I tried. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next up, Ben Whitworth. Uh, ben is also a neighbor of the parks. Ben is involved at uh, Charity Hospital. I mean, geez, I'm sorry, a Children's Hospital. I've got a relatively unique position. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I'm a neighbor both personally and professionally. I live uh, not far down the road, down Laurel Street, uh, but also I work at Children's Hospital uh, and have the pleasure of being a neighbor physically, but also a partner. We've got, um, in addition to so being adjacent and sharing concerns with the train and the parking uh, with the levy, uh, we also uh, partner with the Miracle League uh, 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 field, which is a special needs program, and so we, we value our partnership with Audubon and uh, the, 
the work we do with Carrollton for the Miracle League field. So we, we, I've, I've enjoyed the public process as a, as a neighbor and, um, and look forward to some of the development here. Um, and we're happy to partner at Children's too, just on some of the issues with security, lighting, logistics. Um, and of course, concern with Magazine Street, when the construction work begins on the road, how that's gonna impact um, us. We have a lot of traffic from the hospital, both employees and uh, as well as patients who are gonna be stuck and affected. So if we, as long as we can make it safer for pedestrians, bikers, and cars, we're, uh, we're happy to help and I'm glad to be here. Great. So, thank you. Thanks, Ben. And two points there. We've had the opportunity to work with Children's for 25 years, as well as with the Audubon Institute. And many of the challenges of access and uh, balance are precisely the same that we continue to deal with at, uh, at Children's. How do we become be a good neighbor? Uh, for those of you all that were not here at the last meeting, we had, and refresh my memory, Tracy, it was the City of New Orleans representative with the traffic... DPW representative, uh, where we, uh, where they were able to explain what the general plan is. Uh, I can't answer it specifically, but uh, hopefully we'll be getting more information from DPW shortly. But the thought I think that was expressed, as I recall, was uh, they are going to try to segment off both uh, one side of Magazine Street at a time and create conditions where, uh, you know, it, it can be improved, half of the street can be improved. So it certainly there will be a period of time where that, the, the traffic and access issues on this part of the, this entire part of the, the city are going to be exacerbated by that. But, uh, you know, I guess the ultimate goal is that we'll have a much better uh, road and hopefully one that we can influence the design of when it deals with crossings and pedestrian safety. So thanks, Ben. Okay, Russell Ahrensberg. Russell. Um, oh, okay. All right, Russell's going to pass. Next up, Scott Howard. Scott? Um, my name is Scott Howard, and I represent an organization known as, as Parks for All. And I, I came here with, with the idea of, of talking about preservation and, and heritage and wanting to be sure that it was well covered um, in, in the planning process. But uh, I can see I missed the first two uh, events, so I, I'm standing humbly before you to say that I, it, it would appear that you're, you're doing a, a, a good job of that taking cognizance of, of, of the history and, and the design ideas. Maybe the only thing I would add to it would be, uh, as I look at the website, there isn't, unless I missed it, a lot of information about the cultural heritage of the park. And I think from a, education is talked about as one of the objectives of the planning process. So it, it, it might be good to uh, memorialize better than we have some of the things that you obviously are very well aware of, like the use of the lagoons to promote drainage, and now it's uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Here it yeah. is, something that we're relying on. Those are important ideas, I think, that, that need to be more in the mind of, of, of everyone so that we're in a better position to know how to undertake adaptive change that honors heritage. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and I, and I appreciate the compliments. We've obviously taken this assignment very seriously, and there is a lot of good documentation and research. I mean, this, uh, this park has a rich, rich history. I'm born and raised here, and I, I swam in that uh, pool before it was closed when I was a child. But understanding from you know eight, the 1880s, 1890s, through the expansion in the 1920s, it's a wonderful, rich story that is tied deeply into the development of the city with you know, key individuals, both locally, regionally, and nationally. But thanks for acknowledging that. And I do think it's a great idea that part of the, our master plan can, in fact, be a piece that talks about the wonderful history and legacy of the park. So thanks so much. Thank you. Next up, Bill Ives. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'll try to be quick. My wife and I are very committed to the success of Ottoman Park. 
and working with Michael Nias, we secured a grant from the Arts Council of New Orleans supplemented with matching private donations to repair and restore the stage for viewing the art pavilion on the fly. It's part of the Arts Council's efforts to refurbish public art across the city for our 300th birthday. These funds allow the project to go forward without any cost to Audubon Nature Institute. Uh, this work is ongoing with cooperation from Audubon staff and Michael's significant pro bono work. And we thank Audubon for providing the water for the pressure washing. <laughs> After this investment, we hope that this pavilion will be included as a permanent part of Ottoman Park in the new master plan. Um, the rest of what I have to say is in the same spirit of wanting to make the park redder. I applaud the need for a balance in land use, and I like the slideshow, and I like much of what I heard. Now, I read in an article in the Lens that currently 15% of the total of Ottoman Park is devoted to public access green space and 85% requires an entrance fee, a greens fee, or membership in an organization. Now, these figures may be inaccurate, and I invite Ottoman to offer a correction. Um, but I did want to say that, in contrast <coughs> to another Olmsted project, Central Park in New York, the ratio is reversed. 85% of Central Park is open access public green space. 15% is devoted to ball fields in the Sioux. And if I go to cities like San Francisco, Vancouver, and Seattle, I see parks where the vast majority is open access green space. So it seems if we were considered balanced land use, in my opinion, we need to look at opening more of the park to green space, including picnic space, tree pre preservation, perhaps with the Bizzo property, um, so we continue to enjoy it as Ottoman Park. Thank you. Bill, thanks so much. And that is a good uh, segue, a good opportunity at this point. Uh, we have AutoCAD digital drawings of the entire campus. We've been doing our own and we're double checking, triple checking the math, but it will be available to everyone. Uh, we, are, we said that we're gonna do this in two pieces. Analysis, we're gonna break it into lots of little pieces and then synthesis. So we've had somebody on our staff calculating with the polylines precisely what the acreage is. Hopefully this is, uh, is this legible to everybody, in, including the folks in the back? We made the print as big as we could, make sure it fit. But what we did was look at, again, not just programmed versus unprogrammed. You know, a baseball field is one thing, a soccer field is another thing, a running track is another thing. Uh, what we did was, the only editorializing we did when we looked at this is the area B, it's kind of a grayscale, which is the golf course. We included in that area, there are four lagoons within the bounds of the golf course that we calculated with, included with the golf course. There's an M there, the blue, the lagoon that snakes along there. We calculated that separately. So whether that's green space, blue space, however you want to do it, it's your option to figure out how you choose to batch these. The way we look at it, that lagoon is an incredibly important part of the experience of walkers, joggers, and everybody else. So we set the limits of the golf course inboard, if you will, from that lagoon designated as M. Uh, we also, you see the A, which is the zoo, and the F, which is the large uh, surfaced uh, parking lot adjacent to the zoo. We broke it down separately between the F and the O immediately adjacent to that, acknowledging that although that's green space, it's green space that is used as parking uh, overflow as well. So we've simply not editorialized, we've simply put the numbers up as they are and we have calculated them. And out of the end, we have a lot of pie charts with numbers, but then we went and simplified. We said, let's, let's batch that. I know these, it's a little bit difficult to read, but let's batch it into four categories. Uh, what we're calling open space and lagoon is specifically the blue lagoon that snakes along the exposition site edge. Uh, open space is entirely open space. It does not include uh, the soccer fields. If you look to the next category, the slightly lighter green programmed open space, 
is seven and a half acres. That is the soccer field and the two very small playgrounds over on St. Charles Avenue. And then thirdly, we broke in a separate category, which is the public parking and right-of-way. And again, I'm not editorializing. These numbers are what they are. It's up to you, the public and community, to choose to put these in whatever category you want. I see the parking not as a programmed activity, particularly when I was used to wheel my mom out here because she was in a wheelchair. It was a, it's a necessity for people that use, a lot of people that use the park that aren't in a healthy condition to where they can walk or bike from somewhere else. But I leave it to you to choose how you choose to batch it. Uh, and then finally, the programmed activities, which are again the grayscaled one, the zoo, the golf course, the stables, and the sports facilities other than soccer, uh, the acreage there is established. Uh, so when we look at the numbers, and again, we, we will provide all of this, you can batch it accordingly, but the numbers are what they are, and we welcome the opportunity for you to look and examine and cross-check the numbers. But this is a good opportunity to clarify uh, information. Uh, our calculations show that 49% of the space is programmed activities, the zoo, the golf course, stables, and parks. Uh, the public parking and right-of-way is 24 acres, which is approximately 8%. The programmed open space, primarily the soccer fields at 7.5 acres, is a probably rounded it up to 2%. The open space lagoon, at, based on our digital calculations, which we're prepared to share with anybody that would like them, is 132 uh, acres, which is 41% of the park. Um, so those are the numbers as we calculate them, and we welcome the opportunity to, to share those or discuss those with uh, anybody that would like. But thanks again for your comment. Okay, next up, Carolyn Leftwich. Thank you. Um, like the gentleman who just spoke, when I visit city parks in Seattle and other parts of the country, one of the beauty of the parks is the natural space that people come there to enjoy. And I enjoy this park twice a day because I only live around the corner. And I wanted to make a couple of comments. First, when it comes to parking, um, have you considered, since we do have buses running up and down here and we have the blue bikes, which are really great, we don't see too many uptown, but they're really working really well in other parts of the city to incentivize both your employees and people to take public transportation to get here, as well as carpools, incentivize people to carpool to work, and use the, the blue bikes. And I'm so excited to see that you're going to be having new crosswalks because I'm in this park twice a day. And I would encourage you to put signage out there that prioritize people over the cars because people in Louisiana or New Orleans don't realize that pedestrians have the right of way over cars. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I'm glad to see that you're, being, you're going to be incorporating water management um, into the future um, in the park. I'd like to make a comment on the wonderful uh, playgrounds that we have uh, just added and also the improvements to the new shelter, it seems as though anything new that comes up, perhaps you can incorporate poorer surfaces versus more concrete like was incorporated in those uh, three new projects. I was a little taken back by the amount of concrete that was being poured. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carolyn, and it's uh, precisely on point. How do we incentivize options? I, I'm fir we firmly believe that the solution to uh, traffic access and parking is not to make it easier and, or to, to, to widen traffic, provide more parking. We believe in some cases that, in fact, just creates more traffic. The, the, the goal is to incentivize other ways in which people can use the park effectively that by their very nature uh, mitigate the need for uh, vehicular access and parking. And certainly uh, the idea of porous uh, surfaces, every square foot of impermeable surface 
you know, now in the city of New Orleans with new construction has to be mitigated now elsewhere. So the new ideas about green design uh, start with that. Let's first and foremost create conditions where we can live with water rather than trying to pave everything and pump it away. So thanks so much, Carol. Next up, Kevin Thibodeau. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm on the board of directors of Bike Easy, and if you're not familiar with them, um, they advocate and represent all people who ride bicycles in New Orleans. Um, we have over 8,000 subscribers, about 500 supporting members, and a social media reach of about 9,000. Bike Easy advocated for the Complete Streets Ordinance enacted in 2011. Since then, the city has more than doubled its bicycle network. Bicycles, bicyclists, sorry, now represent an increasing sector of the New Orleans population. Um, our policy and design committee, which we have a lot of talented folks on, has prepared a set of recommendations that they're going to send you next week. Um, the recommendations touch on a few of the issues you've already spoken about. And um, look, listening to it tonight, it sounds like you guys have done a great job at addressing a lot of bicycle issues. But the recommendations are going to touch on bike lanes, traffic calming measures on magazine, crosswalks on magazine, um, bicycle entry points to the park, fly access that's to, from, and through the park, um, lighting, and exposition boulevard, possibly widening it to allow bicycles to go down that path as well. So again, we appreciate the opportunity to, to give you our recommendations, and you guys look like you are doing a great job of taking bicyclists into account, so thank you very much. Kevin, thank you, and we talk a lot about multiple voices at the table. Sometimes the best ideas come from unexpected places, so any new thoughts, any thinking, any ideas about how we can mitigate some of those challenges are greatly appreciated, so thank you, Kevin. Okay, next up. Uh, Sandra Bapti. Hi, I'd like to make um, uh, two suggestions for the master plan. Um, one's kind of micro, and that's that you address the shoreline erosion of the lagoon, mm -hmm. um, where uh, the downriver side that um, you know uh, faces Exposition Boulevard and the shoreline that faces uh, St. Charles Avenue. Those are the most heavily um, trafficked areas of the park, I think. And um, the, uh, I think this will address the water quality of the lagoon. If you take some steps to um, improve the shoreline, it really needs to be protected from erosion. It's very compacted, it's overused, um, it's, uh, it could provide better wildlife opportunities if it were, you know, more natural. And um, I see that there's been recently some really big blocks put in to prevent the erosion, but no plantings. And um, when I worked on a, a similar park, uh, an Olmstead Design Park in uh, upstate New York, that. Um, I was the president of the Conservancy. We did a master plan where we uh, looked at other Olmstead parks and what they had done to improve the shoreline. Um, we looked at the Harlem Mirror in Central Park and also the Little Pond, which is the Harlem Mirror's up at the north end. And they did things like boulders with um, irises planting in between and grasses. And where you want to allow the public to um, get closer to the water, um, we built a boardwalk, actually built something out over the water so the shoreline edge wasn't uh, compromised. So that's just a, uh, that's my first suggestion, um, kind of a micro suggestion. Uh, and the second suggestion um, you've started to address in your, um, in your master planning documents about uh, green infrastructure. Um, I was uh, recently um, reading the Sioux and Water Board's uh, planning documents and I have a copy I wanted to show you. It's about City Park. What great um, opportunity for taking other bigger citywide water management in, um, issues into consideration when you look at your green infrastructure. Thank you so much, Sandra. And that's great information. I'm going to put you on the spot. If you, uh, Wes Michaels, our landscape architect, if you can hang around for a few minutes afterwards, I'd love to talk a couple specific thoughts about what you shared, particularly on the shoreline erosion. So thanks, Sandra. 
Okay, next up, J. Roger Brown, Jr. I would say one thing I didn't really see a lot on, existing infrastructure needs a lot of high priority on a master plan. The roadway in the Riverview hadn't been touched in what, decades? Many decades, if anybody remembers when it was last paved, if ever, the, um, like Shelter 10 needs to be gutted to the walls, rebuilt with termite, moisture proof, vandal proof material, not the kind of half assed stuff that they've been doing over the years. Do it right, it's embarrassing to see tourists go in there. And for any recreational space, particularly up on the Riverview, it should be open to all. No restrictions. No, quote, private groups. It should be open. And you don't need a stadium or fancy AstroTurf soccer fields. And one last thing, maybe somebody from the park can get public works out there and fix, fix the pothole to the entrance <laughs> of the parking lot on the other side of the magazine street that I go off. It's getting worse every day. But if they can get that to you know, do it. And also for the crosswalks, you pay, you, Stripe it, you put signs up. Right. Stop for pedestrians. It's working in other parts of the city where they've done it. Okay, all right. Roger, thank you so much. Uh, next up, Stephen Lindsley. Lindsley? Hi, um, my name is Steve Lindsley. I'm a longtime member of the Audubon Park Tennis Club, a past president. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the entire club. We have uh, we've had to cap our membership at 60 people because uh, the courts that are in existence now can't accommodate any anymore. Um, and as the population ages, uh, the majority of our members are over 40. As the population continues to age and continues to stay active, uh, there's going to be a higher demand for those soft courts, so we would via vehemently oppose giving up any of those soft courts for anybody or any purpose. Uh, we also are, are um, recognizing that uh, Chris, who is the management person there and the head pro, has done an excellent job with uh, limited staff and uh, limited resources. He continues to do an excellent job. We have a, a really good working relationship with him. Uh, we would like to set up an ad hoc committee to uh, meet with whoever in this group is gonna be in charge of that particular part of the plan. Uh, as well as Chris, uh, to we have a number of other ideas are, and some more input about how this facility can turn into a first-class facility. Since it's we're we're nearing uh, almost 100 years mm -hmm. uh, in association with uh, this place, and looking into the, I'd like to be here for that, but um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so we, we, we do need to upgrade the courts that we do have. Uh, they need to be raised. There's some drainage issues. Fence needs to be mended and repaired and painted. Uh, screens need to be replaced. Uh, also, we would like to see that this turned into a, a first-class facility like the rest of the park. Um, and that would include uh, building a clubhouse. Right now, we have two bathrooms um, and a very small office space. And we would also like to have uh, lights for night play, uh, since the baseball field has a huge number of lights. Um, we think it's time for us to have lights, and we would also like to work with you in terms of maybe doing some fundraising to offset some of that cost. Thank okay. You. Uh, for further comment, uh, Stephen, uh, if you, uh, Tracy Lee, uh, if you, we don't, uh, you had mentioned about providing specific information. I was particularly intrigued about, you know, we do, our thought is that there is uh, uh, repairs, upgrades, enhancements that need to make. As we had mentioned, we don't anticipate, we don't recommend for expansion, but we, we would love to hear specific ideas about what the, the tennis court needs. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, next up, Claiborne Simon. Good evening. I'm Claiborne Simon. I'm a uh, board member of the New Orleans Metropolitan Area Tennis Association. Uh, one of our responsibilities is to schedule league play 
for all of the metropolitan area. And as you might suppose, most people who play tennis work during the day, so they need to play at night. Right now there's a extremely uh, extreme shortage of lighted courts in the metropolitan area. And we have a very tough time of finding places for these people to play league play at. Secondly, one thing I'm responsible for is to bring tournaments here to the New Orleans area, state tournaments that, are, that we can have. We currently do that. We've had some at UNO and some at City Park. Uh, oft times those facilities are not available when the need arises to bid on for a particular weekend or something. We'd like to see Audubon uh, tennis courts upgraded, restroom facilities, uh, lights, so that we could uh, secure more of these tournaments to our area. Thank you. Thank you, Claiborne. Okay, next up, Oliver Hauck. Thank you. I will be brief. Um, I wanted to say, I think on behalf of many people here, and we're here not long ago when the idea of the master plan first resurfaced, uh, how impressed and pleased I think I am, and I think others are, how, how far you've come and how open-minded you've been. I could not penetrate your, your, your website in order to enter comments, so I came down tonight to, to <laughs> fill the gap. Um, the most frightening thing I've heard tonight is that someone has apparently proposed to reopen the Riverfront Expressway idea. <laughs> Great Scott, <laughs> kill it. Uh, um, uh, and the most encouraging is, of course, to me, and I think many people, the idea that of status quo, no expansion. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, sigh of relief. The, uh, I assume that by no expansion that means not only lateral expansion, but also structures up, fences within, that sort of thing. Status quo, the way it is, as well as the size it is, okay? And that leads me to the following notion. Your attention to traffic, your attention to drainage, your attention to, to those kinds of nuts and bolts issues are, is very impressive. What's missing, I think, and where I think you could usefully put next thoughts, is what to do with the unenhanced natural potential of the green space you have, particularly on the fly, in particular that upstream portion of the fly. It's just cut grass right now. And it could be so much more. It could be treed, it could be gardened. You have the opportunity for the largest wildflower garden in the city, just along the Batcher by the, uh, by the railroad tracks. So many opportunities. Uh, and I would hope you could enlist the good offices of uh, schools of landscape architecture, and you could have a competition. Uh, as long as they realized they weren't designing monuments and memorials for, for Civil War <laughs> veterans, but, 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 you know, they were trying to get with nature, right? right. And I sense that's in your genes, I sense it's in your plans, and I encourage you to go forward with it. But please think about that, and if you'd like any assistance from some of us on that, I'd be happy to help. Oliver, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the comment. Good. Thank you. Okay, next up, Judith Thigpen. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. I've been at every one of these planning meetings and I have been a strong advocate, as have others, on no further development in the park. So I'm thrilled and mostly just relieved that you're gonna focus on care and maintenance issues in the park that have been neglected. And I also would hope that in future a stronger and better relationship is created with the public and this institution when the millage comes up, when it does repeatedly, and you don't have a lot of support, I think it's because there isn't the relationship built with community members in opportunities like this one. And I think the planning process was robust, but it could be better. Some of the questions, I didn't complete the survey because 
the prioritized areas, there were four of them that I wanted to prioritize, and the rest didn't have anything to do with care maintenance. They had to do with development. So I, I stopped. And so I, I heard tonight that my input that I did give wasn't counted in the summary because it wasn't complete as a survey. So, and then going out and asking people f what they think about four specific areas strikes as biased a little bit, gotta tell you. So, and then one of the things that breaks down trust, I think, the most in this relationship is holding outside of this planning process the golf course, which benefits few people. We, we haven't even seen the numbers like we did of the tennis plays, and I think we saw the number 2,500 games, and then we heard 60 members, so it still smacks a little bit of a private industry, you know, private group, but um, people like to play tennis, that's great. The golf course, I have heard in these planning discussions from advocates for preservation that that loses money every year. And if we don't, and now we don't get to see those numbers because they've been removed from the latest report. So I think not necessarily to do away with it, but I think we need to talk about it. We need to have the opportunity to talk about things like that and not just hold harmless. The zoo, last point, we have voted on as a community. We have supported. We have applauded the advancements in the zoo, and we haven't had the opportunity to have that discussion about the golf course. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. We, I can uh, tell you about usage of the golf course, and because it wasn't included in the dialogue, so I didn't have the number, so apologies for that. Um, <clears throat> on average, each year we have 30,000 rounds of golf played in. That gives you an idea, at least about the number of individuals that that make use of this. What's the average of an individual per round? I'm sorry? How many individuals would you guess that consist I, I could go back and try to extrapolate, and I can do that, and we can try to get that information. I just, it, that is the number, much like we, we say 2,500 games were played in baseball. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll clarify the, the, the data and the information. So. I'm sorry. Making a profit. First, first of all, the um, we'll get that information on the usage, the revenue, the expenses, any information we'll include it in the report. Okay. Uh, the reason it was not included was that there's two things. One, the golf course has been there over a hundred years. Um, it, it was part of an original design. Uh, when it was rebuilt about actually seven or eight years ago, it was done with state capital money. And when you use state capital money, you have to have a life for the project, for the funding, that goes through, a, I think it's a 20 year period. Uh, there could be an opportunity at the end of that time period to look at what we do with the golf course in the future. But legally, the restraints on the golf course um, are in place right now, will stay in place right now. That's why the zoo, which is over 100 years old, and the golf course over 100 years old, was not included in the planning because there's restrictions tied with the funding of that project. But as far as the data you're asking for, I think that's a great request um, that we can follow through with and add that information into the document, as well as tennis, as well as horseback riding, as far as all the activities. We'd be glad to do that. Okay, thanks. Next up, Keith Hardy. Good evening. Um, I want to talk a bit about the what appears to be the theme of the master plan, which is maintaining the balance that exists today. I believe that's how you worded it. Um, that balance is post zoo, post golf course expansion. It is, uh, I think it's a flaw in the process regardless of these excuses about, well, we can't do it because of the money. We weren't even allowed to talk about the possibility of dual use of the golf course. Now, you wanted to talk about dual use of soccer fields and other things. What about dual use of the golf course? Why can't we have people have that open for people walking when it's not at use after 6 o'clock at night? Um, this park in City Park 
are really the only two places in the city where we have large expanses, large expanses of uh, unprogrammed natural space. So all of these developments have been put in, the golf course, the zoo, uh, the, the buildings that come in, all of those reduce this unique amenity to the city. And uh, we have restaurants to go to, but now we have several restaurants in this park, at least one in City Park. Uh, we have uh, lots of smaller spaces where people can go walk around. But you know, it's not the same walking in a one block neighborhood park, walking around and around as it is getting out and being in the middle of a large expanse of oak trees and other things. So again, I think we need to really look toward cutting back on the golf course, cutting back on the zoo, cutting back on some of the programmed activities and open it up. We have, you know, we're, we're all trapped in our automobiles for a certain amount of period every day. And uh, I Keith, think- I'm sorry, go ahead, please wrap up. And I think you need to look at limiting, nudging strongly people to, to either stop or discourage people from bringing automobiles on spaces like the fly. There's no reason why people can't park in the lot and walk up to the fly. So thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Okay, next up, Jack Davis. Thanks to the commissioners and the consultants for uh, listening to all these, you know, great ideas, great comments from uh, uh, the folks in the room and, and previously. Um, there's, I could talk for hours about the, the things I heard, just I heard tonight. Uh, there's a lot of good things and a lot of uh, some bad things that I'm worried about. I w I'll, in editing my remarks down from 45 minutes to two, I'll leave out most of the good things, but the, um, uh, I was happy to see the openness towards the expanding the fly onto the Biso towboat territory. We've got to come up with a better map that's is more accurate in nomenclature. They're all, they're three Biso properties, but right. that that's a, a detail. It would be a great thing. The thing that concerns me most about what I heard tonight uh, is as someone who lives right on the uh, Walnut Street edge of the park, uh, across from n number two up there, uh, I spend a lot of my time, inordinate amount, uh, watching traffic moving in the park, and I'm watching a lot of cars. And I, I was really disturbed that the options, Mark, that you had for moving vehicles around the fly consisted of option one and option two, which are just two variations on two-way traffic. Uh, back in the 1970s, uh, Audubon experienced probably the most beneficial thing that happened in the last century, half century of the park, which was the removal of cars from the front part, front, the area between Magazine Street and, uh, and St. Charles, that part of the park. It's now, it, if you, could, you couldn't imagine the peacefulness and the, and the serenity that we have now in that area if you still had cars. That was a great move, and I think that this strategic plan ought to be I think we're past the point where we can get rid of cars altogether because of the commitments to soccer and baseball. But we ought to be looking at ways of reducing cars. You should have an option zero or call it an option three, but it ought to be something that, that s suppresses use of automobiles through various techniques, whether it's bicycles or public transportation or restricting joyriding. But there should be fewer cars in general in the, car, in the park. One, that, that area, number two, uh, can I, just one quick sure. comment on tree roots. It's related to cars. In a, on a day like today, of which we have many in the park, uh, zoo patrons park on all of the oak trees in that area. So if you're talking about restricting parking on oak, on, on oak trees, it can't be just the fly, but that's the only thing that was mentioned. It's gotta be throughout the park. And num number two here was, was uh, o for open space on the, one of the other maps. It's really parking. It's auxiliary parking. It's a tribute to the success of the zoo. And if you want to keep protect those trees, there's got to be restrictions on on the uh, 
parking on the, on the routes. Anyway, thanks for letting me run over a little. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. Uh, next up, Richard Bates. Just want to thank you uh, for hearing our calls to preserve, protect, and expand green space. Um, I want to make emotional appeal. Um, I've heard some of the green space called passive. I find green space is where I feel the most active. I most actively process thought, emotion, and friendship. Uh, so I'm very pleased to hear uh, that, that, that you're hearing um, that will preserve and protect green space. Um, and I just want to add my also concern about adding two-way traffic on the fly. Um, it feels like you'd be moving Magazine Street to the fly, and then we would have sort of the problem that we have at Shelter 13 where we can't be with our kids. It would be the whole fly uh, where people would be going backwards and forwards. Um, most terrifying uh, moment I've had in, almost in my life was when we were at the fly playing softball and a, a drunk driver went berserk between the playground and the statue there. Um, and the only thing that stopped him was actually the, the mud. He, he lost traction in the mud. And so um, I would just like to express concern about accommodating more cars on the fly. Um, I, I would ask you to look more at speed bumps, anything to slow cars down. Um, and agree that the best thing to happen at Audubon Park was the removal of cars in the 70s. Um, made it way more safe for pedestrians and children. Thank you. Richard, thank you so much. Uh, next up, uh, Lewis. I'm not sure I can. Who? Lewis. Come on up, Lewis. <laughs> You mentioned a little bit earlier about resurfacing the tennis courts, and I was wondering what the motivation to putting hard courts would be there. I just turned 65 last week, and I'm not looking forward to playing on any more hard courts. Uh, I want to know what the motivation for that is. Is Tulane University having design on using those courts? And um, secondly, putting hard courts goes against your idea of, of green infrastructure because those are mm -hmm. certainly less porous than the clay courts we're using now. I th uh, thank you. Uh, any other comments, or should I mention? Well, you can that? mention that first. I then. think the fact that we've had at least yeah three representatives, and it's been really well attended in previous meetings on tennis, we probably need to drill down a little bit more detail with you. We are getting lots of good information, and we need as a group to find a way to consolidate it. When we uh, well, we'd be happy to meet with you. I'm I'm on the same club as, as yes. Steve. So if, if if we can set up a meeting with you all to discuss it in depth, that'd be great. That's great. So we can share maybe immediately after the meeting our contact information, and we'll follow up with you directly. D you didn't answer my question about Tulane though. Did they have any design interest in using those existing courts? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure. I don't know. That's not a no. <laughs> <laughs> the courts are very the courts are very difficult to get access to. That's why I advocated for more courts yeah. before I, we, you said we couldn't because of the people who wanted the green space. So we don't want any restriction on them coming in to take our courts. Yeah, we, we have a lot of respect for the tennis club and we will have that meeting. There will not be any decisions made, whether it be all Rubico or some Rubico or hardcore. You asked specifically about Tulane. Tulane, Nord, um, other clubs. We've had many people asking about tennis courts. A lot of people wanted more tennis courts. That was probably the biggest push from other people. We made a choice that at this time, in this master plan, which goes through 2000 and 10 years, 2028. 2028 that we would not expand. Well, I, I, my point is I didn't want Tulane, I didn't want you to put hard courts on there so Tulane would use some of the existing 10 courts that we have access well, to. We have, we have the, the beauty of this planning process is that a lot of people have commented a lot of different ways. Nothing will be happening on that tennis court without meeting to all the players and the tennis club that's been over 100 years is probably our biggest supporters. Yes, he's been there since the beginning, by the way. Is that, <laughs> and Brian Kaplan, too. He was there also. How many people were here from the tennis club? Yeah, so uh, you're lobbying pretty well on, uh, on your behalf. Um, and um, uh, how many of you here from other tennis clubs? Yeah, so, you know, the point is we got a lot of people. 
It's great interest in tennis. I, I would suggest to you, if you looked at the number of people who use the facilities, the tennis court, the density is much heavier on the use of the tennis courts than the use of the golf course. I'm not advocating against the <laughs> golf course, but if you took those 30,000 people divided into the number of acres versus the tennis courts, you come up that we have a much higher density. I think you'll have more people arguing that if we're going to reduce the size of the golf course, it won't be for tennis courts. No, I understand yeah. that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that the, the, the small number of court space that we have is very highly used relative to the golf course usage. That's we're, my point. Well, the wonderful thing about the park is the passion everyone has for what they want to do. And we really would love to do everything everybody wants 10 times over, uh, but it doesn't quite work that way because there has to be the word balance. We're trying to figure out the balance. And I, I will you know, emphasize the key thing that came out of these public meetings was the balance not to move any way, don't add to the, uh, to the development side. Don't add more tennis courts. Don't add more to the golf course. Don't add more to the stables. Don't add more to taking away from green space to keep that balance. Um, and I know some ideally would like to have more on the green space side, but we also just like 20 hands were raised you know, on tennis courts. We have a lot of people's opinion on a lot of different directions, but the master plan, unless something changes with the board, um, will keep the balance percentage-wise what we have right now and won't change that balance. We heard it loud and clear. Thanks, Ron. Next up, Jay Seastrunk. Hi. Um, let's see, I had two concerns about prior comments. So the m gentleman who talked about the fly and regreening it or adding more long, large long-term trees, I think would be an excellent idea. Pulling the road back from the river and planting oak trees that we would realize the benefits of 100 years from now. I think that would be an incredible plan. Um, I was also had concerns about the survey, the fact that the survey when it was presented had the rankings pre-populated and I didn't actually analyze it myself but I was curious how the default rankings compared to the results because I felt like there was an opportunity for bias in the survey because of the, the, the rankings were already prepared for you and you had to rearrange them. Um, and I'd be curious also if the survey data would be available in aggregate like as a PDF. I don't want to know anyone's name but if I could, I'd be interested in just going through it and comparing it to the written comments. And then the last two things, I guess, were my personal peeves, which is lighting on the jogging path. And I've heard lots of talk about best practices in lighting. I've seen people talk about it all day long, but when it comes down to execution, it never happens. Um, I mean, there's some projects recently around here where they built a garage and it was a concern and it, it didn't happen. So again, if we talk about lighting the path, and doing it right, which I think you did. I mean, your, your work is very good here, and you picked out proper fixtures, but th when this goes out to bid, five or 10 years from now, and someone executes it, I have real concerns about it getting done properly, because even the lighting now at the parking lot by the clubhouse is poor. It, it blasts light in all directions, and it's, it's not right. The second thing was, I guess, a big thing for traffic that I see is left turns off of magazine. I think having the one way into the park on one side is probably a good idea because that eliminates the left turn there, but maybe, I mean, I think having no left turns along magazine, what happens is everyone's trying to take a left to get onto the fly and it just backs up and, and causes chaos everywhere. So you basically have to go to St. Charles. So I think making people who want to go to the fly go to St. Charles and Broadway, I mean, they'll figure it out eventually, but I think that would relieve traffic. Um, and those were my main two points. Thank you, Jay. Uh, one comment about the, uh, the methodology of the survey, because that's been brought up several times, not just in this meeting, but previously. What I was, I think what our team was encouraged by is that when we look at the results, if you get away from the fine granular kind of analysis, the results generally show what we have heard in every one of these meetings. You know, maybe not so much on one extreme where we're gonna build more, not on the other extreme where we're gonna uh, decant programs that are already in place. The vast majority of the voices, both in the surveys and in the other, and in the meetings, has been, let's do better with what we've got, neither more nor less. Let's just enhance and improve the, the options that are available. So in that regard, I thought the, sur my sense is the survey validated what we've heard from you in now three community meetings. Thanks, Jay. Next up, Maria Page. Yep. 
Maria Page. Okay. Next up, Carrie Becker. Hello, I'm Carrie Becker. I am a New Orleans homeowner and a lifelong resident of uh, this area. Um, I am a member of the New Orleans Metropolitan Tennis Association on the board. I am also the local league liaison for Southern section of the United States Tennis Association, as well as I work with Cleburne and the rest of our uh, committee on getting local state tournaments in our area. Um, we're asking for lights for the tennis courts and to keep them clay. Um, lights would open up so much more for us in this area. Lights in courts are hard to come by at night. I just found out today that Aurora Country Club is closing and that's nine courts we're losing again. Um, as far as league coordinators go, there are not enough courts at night for all the people that want to play tennis. Uh, Thursday night, I actually, my tennis team, there's a Thursday night tennis league called TNT. There are about 350 ladies that play tennis on Thursday nights. And there's a waiting list for people who want to play tennis and there's not enough courts with lights. Um, there's also, with USTA, there are grants available to help us to get lights and also for facilities to help in securing money for that as well. So if you put lights, we can fill the courts. All right, Carrie, thank you so thank much. You. I appreciate your input. Next up, uh, Harold uh, Giarcello. Yes. Um, what I wanted to, to say was that there, um, a lot of us have been to parks that have golf courses and zoos and stables, I guess, and other things. But to me, what, what is the, the, the intrinsic, the heart of this park is the oak trees. And I think you've correctly identified the historic trees as one of the key principles. So two things I'd like to you know, just raise awareness of. Um, they're neat. You've got to figure out a more maybe intuitive way to keep people from parking all over the, the routes. I mean, today, what was going on here this week? You know, this place was cr has been crazy all week. And the cars are everywhere, right up on the oak trees. You know, they're right in by the, the fountain. And they're, they're all over. So, you know, we've got to um, find a way to, to keep, the, keep those, protect the trees. And the other thing that I don't think a lot of people realize about the trees is the where, where the buses come and sit and idle and the black soot is belching out of these. These are uh, 20, mid 20th century technology vehicles. I mean, they're, they're ancient, belching, uh, huge, mostly empty, uh, mass transit uh, monsters that are totally out of place in, in the park. And so that something needs, some thought needs to be given to how they, how they egress in and out of the park, where they uh, egress, and how to get them, um, you know, to use whatever leverage we can to get them cleaner, quieter, you know, more 21st century technology. Because again, it's, it's a protection for, for the ecosystem and in particular the trees. Yes. Thank you, Harold. I appreciate the input. Next up, Amy. Merciera? Merceca. Merceca. Um, I'm just going to add some weight to uh, what Harold's also said and, and what one of the other um, gentlemen before me had also uh, mentioned just with regards to the, the parking and the tree preservation. And um, given that you talked a lot about the Riverside, just ensuring that you're considering uh, the Magazine Street side and the overflow parking for the zoo. Um, and just being living in this neighborhood uh, this week in particular was pretty crazy and people park everywhere. Um, so I appreciate that all these changes, which are great, take time to implement, but even if the park could consider some, just some interim measures just to get some more order out there and adherence to um, not parking around those trees because I've, I mean, I've watched people spin their tires and mud on the trees and it's, um, yeah, it's not, <laughs> pretty to see. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and then also too, I just, I guess also just to echo what uh, another gentleman said, just in terms of the open green space, if it's parked out on, um, you can't use it for um, mm -hmm. open green space, so. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thanks for the input. Next up, Mary Fanning Hor Horacio. Good 
morning. I'm Mary Fanning Horace, and I'm president of ORNA, which is Audubon Riverside Neighborhood Association. And we are your neighbors on the, the down riverside and on the riverside primarily. So we are patrons, we love the park, but we also are affected by traffic. And we've had, uh, we have a lot of our members that are also members of the Magazine Street Business Association as well. And one of the things I would like to ask is that I see that Allison has been working with the city and I would, I would, hi, I would really like to have um, some input in, into this. Just some notes that I have, I mean, for our side, uh, we're dealing with um, everyone that's on this side. It's, it's a major, Magazine Street's a major path to Jefferson Parish. Mm -hmm. Anything that, for example, health facility, Oxner, I have had three instances where we could not get my sister through Magazine Street to Oxner, and she has stage four cancer. Um, children's, they have the other situation where people can't get to children's if they're coming from Jefferson Parish. Um, Hankel, those employees are on shift work. Children's employees are on shift work. Lycée Francais, uh, parents. Further up the river, we have the people at the core that are coming in the other direction, but also because they are on shift work, Cars are backing up on that side, which backs up us, and you all know this. You all have to deal with it every day. I'm just asking for some additional assistance. For example, well, filming. We, we were recently notified that there was going to be some traffic impact on St. Charles Avenue. However, there were a lot of film crew parked on that, that green space and maybe extras. I don't know what they were, but whatever, issues, safety, fire, special events. If you all have multiple events going on, please engage NOPD in order to assist getting the traffic moving. And I would have to agree with this other person that's saying left turn on, you know, on to uh, the idea theoretically of two way is good, but how are you going to implement the left turns into the park? Mm -hmm. So primarily, okay. um, and, and if during rush hours, if traffic could get um, a little priority just during rush hours, the two times of the day, and then you know those things at Turo, how they have a, where you push the buttons and if somebody's waiting they can get across, maybe that might help. Right. So that's it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Mary. Next up, Dubrovka Gillick. Good evening. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. I'm a user, daily user of the park, and also a professional planner. And uh, as both of these uh, things, I'm kind of leading me to two critical issues that I haven't heard anybody talk about tonight. Uh, maybe uh, they were kind of touched on tangentially, but uh, one is like the, the uh, scope of this and specificity of this master plan. What we are going to expect in a level of details that we're gonna get uh, regarding, we kind of saw a little bit unbalanced presentation. You had a pretty uh, specific plans for the uh, transportation and for the traffic improvements. However, you are rather general talking about the lagoons and the drainage as well as the lighting. It was kind of like really I would like to see that uh, level kind of defined somewhere and how you communicate what we are as a public to expect of this plan. We understand that it's a 20-year document that is going to guide some investments and uh, capital budgeting and all of that that you have. However, we would like to see, because this is the process that you are going to set some specifics and also some priorities. And that kind of a communication will also go a long way, I believe, uh, because you started this, I'm glad that you started this uh, process as 
kind of talking about the balance of the land uses. Mm -hmm. However, that was not followed by your maps. We had to wait for the end of the meeting <laughs> to get to the land use map. So it seems like it's not uh, kind of coming forward up front, uh, whatever you are trying to communicate. So that's pretty much it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dubrovka. Next up, Ann Farmer. I, kind of last but not least, um, I am want to talk about the traffic and about um, the going up to the fly. So I was involved with Napoleon Avenue with the drainage situation, and I was a strong proponent for traffic calming because Napoleon Avenue had become such a speedway. And uh, we still are having to deal with that situation. They did not install traffic calming yet because they haven't repaved the street. But I want you to seriously advocate and, and work on that. I also think that a light, um, like she was just describing that they have at Turo, would be an excellent idea. And then I would like to emphasize, uh, because I use the front and the back of the park, um, th that we might want to think uh, because I think it would be great if we could use the um, zoo parking lot for overflow for the fly situation that we might want to look at putting in, like we have the Crescent Park, the arc over the railroad track that also has an elevator that would make it handicapped accessible as well as allow the people with the strollers, et cetera, just be able to walk over those tracks. And I would like on the, the walkway that is in that kind of narrow area to have the permanent bullocks so the cars can't come over on mm -hmm. the, the walkers. Those are my points. And thank you so mm -hmm. much. Yes, certainly pedestrian safety is, uh, is absolutely essential. It's a critical element, thanks. Next up, Richard Carrier. Oh, I might be the last person, I don't know. A couple more. Oh, a couple more. <laughs> yeah, okay, so Audubon Nature Institute is an educational organization, and that's a great opportunity for getting these things right. Um, lots of people now know that it's a problem on certain weekends when they come out, but if they start thinking individually and as a group, well, what can we do to change that? That could be some signage simply have a sign up if it's a busy weekend that you're coming think about carpooling biking walking in fact think about that all the time just to put that in people's minds bike racks i don't think there's a lot of them at the fly some people might feel more comfortable bringing their bike out out, out if they can lock it up for a couple hours and walk you know better chance that bike will still be there the trees, uh, I know there's talk about the two-way streets. There's also some concerns about that. If at the river walk or the, the fly, that section, that's the, most, the area I most likely go to, if it is not going to become two-way and you're protecting the trees, which I think you'll have to put bollards so people can't go around them and still park next to them, so it will really block them off, you could actually perhaps have parallel parking and get 20 to 30 of those lost spaces just by doing that. And then when you have one of these massively busy weekends, all kinds of live oaks are imperiled. I understand there's the Oak Alley, for instance. They're imperiled. At Jackson Barracks, I believe John Benton told me they spent something like $240,000 to preserve one oak tree by moving it, you know. Wow. Another idea, very quickly, with the educational aspect, is to consider compostable materials at all venues, all venues that Audubon has. I can think of almost no organization in the region, and actually you'll be educating people who are coming in from who knows where, that that's the way we need to be moving as a society. Get away from the plastics as much as possible. Thank All you. right. Thanks so much, Richard. Next up, 
Julie Schwamm Harris. Hello, I am a park user, but I'm here actually to talk about the birds and enhance some of the comments Oliver Hauck made about green space and the importance of Audubon Park as one of the massive areas. We're in a flyway. I'm not a big birder, but I happen to have managed the Urban Bird Treaty some years ago. And, um, and it's really important that that just be a layer in your thoughts about the, whatever plan you're doing for the, the natural habitat of the park. Um, it's also an opportunity for education. Um, as an urban area, we can educate people about what they can be doing in their yards and identifying birds and refer them to websites of the birding, um, the, those birders that do know a lot about birds. So just put that, and of course Audubon, this is Audubon Park, so it's quite appropriate. Um, I just wanted to also mention the, because you're talking a lot about infrastructure drainage that uh, St. Charles Avenue is flooded a lot. It's actually become mosquito um, breeding zone, often uh, for days at a time. It's definitely more than the 36 hours. And so, um, and I know there's some serious problems with the underground drainage. It's got to be coordinated with the city and money and all that. But it, it is it is really essential. And um, and 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 even just um, maintenance of the leaves and the you know in, just like a good property owner anywhere should do could be taken care of. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Julie. And the last card, Gregory Ferris. Thank you. I think it's, uh, this is the first and only uh, planning session that I've been to. I just came tonight to see what was going on. Uh, Audubon Park has been an integral part of my life since at least when I was five years old in 1929. And I've, I've gone on the swan boat, I've walked through the, gone up Monkey Hill, at the whole, the, the carousel, and so forth. In 1956, when I was uh, in medical school, uh, I joined the Audubon Park Tennis Club. And that's been a very important part of my life since then. And of course, the courts uh, were initially over where the carousel was, and then they moved where, uh, you know where they've gone. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the tennis courts are under some kind of uh, uh, danger of not being properly cared for or enhanced or so forth. I would like the uh, planners to listen very carefully to the people who use the tennis courts, the really tennis lovers, they're dedicated, they've gone to a lot of research, and they have a vision, and I think that uh, uh, the thing I could say is uh, it's important that the tennis courts be done correctly. Gregory, thanks so much, and thanks for the historic perspective. You probably saw most of those images with the, the swimming pool and all of the other things from back in the 50s. Uh, that wraps up this piece. I do want to refresh everyone's memory when uh, the next steps are community meeting number four, and that date we said is May, May 16th. There'll be more information about that. Uh, thanks so much for everybody's participation, and I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank all of you for being here. We really appreciate your input. It's just been tremendous. Um, I also want to encourage you, for those who love the serenity of the park, the beauty of the park, come Sunday afternoon for Music Under the Oaks. Uh, it's really a delightful time, a delightful way to spend a Sunday afternoon. I encourage you to be here. Thank you very much for being here and, and, and continue to use the park and, and give us all your input. Thank you.